Endurance Junkie Podcast, Episode 90. Brought to you by Health IQ, an insurance company that helps health conscious people get special life insurance rates. Go to healthiq.com forward slash junkie to support the show and learn more. <laughs> Christmas. Thanks for joining me on a new episode of the Endurance Junkie Podcast, the show where I will be interviewing some of the fastest, smartest, and most inspiring people active in the endurance world today. And before we get going with today's show, um, yeah, I would like to thank Health IQ for supporting. Now, many people in the endurance community have had trouble with how much they pay for life insurance. And uh, yeah, despite uh, their own health conscious lifestyle, they might get penalized for family history or BMI and stuff like that. Well, Health IQ has decided to change all that, and they will gladly offer you a much sharper rate on your life insurance. So if you want to learn more and uh, get a free quote, just head over to healthiq.com forward slash junkie. That's healthiq.com forward slash junkie to learn more and uh, yeah, maybe save over $1,000 on your yearly premium. Right, on today's show, um, Nick Simmons is a five-time US 800 meter champion, a two-time Olympian, a silver medalist at the 2013 World Championships in Moscow, and a fifth place finisher at the 2012 London Olympics. Now, he recently retired from track and field, and is now focusing on further growing his business, Run Gum, which is a performance-oriented chewing gum with caffeine. So, hi Nick, thanks for uh, coming on the show. Um, Yeah, can you start off by telling us a bit about yourself? and uh, your sporting background, and uh, how you ended up in athletics. Yeah, my name is Nick Simmons, and I'm a two-time Olympian in track and field. I ran the Beijing and London Olympic Games. Uh, 800 meters was my specialty. I also ran the mile a bit. And uh, I recently retired from track and field at the age of 33, and now I just do all kinds of fun stuff. I climb mountains and ride bikes and run marathons and work uh, as the CEO of a energy gum company called Run Gum. Okay, cool. So what was your your sport uh, growing up? Was that always just running? No, I grew up playing soccer. I swam in the summers. Um, I was really into outdoor sports like mountain biking and skiing. Uh, played ice hockey in the winters. But uh, when I was 13, I started running cross country. And I, I didn't love it, but I loved uh, seeing myself get faster and faster each week. And I loved the thrill of setting a new personal best. And that's kind of what took me to track and field. And uh, I've been running ever since. No, okay. So were you pretty competitive from the beginning, or was it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I uh, my humble answer would be no, but I, I'd be lying. I, I was pretty good from the beginning. I was very small and lightweight, and and I wasn't good at a lot of sports, but I was very good at distance running. Um, and I, I was on varsity my freshman year and won a, won state titles and everything from 400 meters up through 5k cross country. Okay. And you think it was just a natural talent for running or did it have something to do with all the sports that you did before? I think mostly natural talent. Uh, I think I think r- playing soccer is a really great way for kids to develop coordination and build uh, both fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. Uh, I was a midfielder and I'd, I'd run, you know, a few miles every game and I, I'd sprint for, for breakaway passes. And um, it was a nice way to to learn about my body and learn about myself as an athlete. But I think that when you're that young and, and showing a lot of success in, in something that's relatively new to you, there's always an inherent uh talent just an ingrained talent that that is shining through there okay so yeah you you ran then during during high school and and college is that it i did yeah uh track and field and cross country four years in high school four years in college okay so yeah at at what point did you realize like okay this is this is my thing and i want to keep doing this and and pursue maybe a career as as a pro athlete i think when i was 21 between my junior and senior year of college i I think a lot of kids when at that age here in the States, uh, you kind of get this uh, kind of a kick in the pants. You say, I've got about nine months to figure out what I'm going to do with my life, and then I'm in the real world, and i got to figure out how to pay bills and make money. And um, I'd been studying biochemistry, so I, I'd kind of thought that I'd go on to more school, but I hated school, so I wanted a way out of that. And I th- thought my the best way for me to not have to go to more school would be to, to turn – 
this running thing into a paying gig. And at that age, I thought it was appropriate to take that risk. And so I kind of dummy, I, I doubled down on the, on the running bet and, you know, basically made it my number one priority and, and put my grades as my second priority and got uh, faster and faster that senior year. I went from being ranked about 50th in the United States in the 800 to being ranked number two. And that's really what launched my pro career. Okay. Did you have any specific habits that you had during that period in your life to, to, to catapult you to that elite level? I think for me, it was more just rearranging the priorities in my mind. So I didn't pull all-nighters anymore um, when I studied. I didn't drink as much. I tried to eat better. I trained harder. It was just every little every little thing that I thought could make me a better runner, I decided to do that instead of the alternative. Okay. So was that working with coaches as well? No, I actually had a really horrible coach in college, and uh, the coaching didn't change a lot. If, if it changed at all, it was in uh, in working closer with my mentor Sam Lapre, who uh, ended up ends, ended up being my my coach and my mentor for 20 years. He's my business partner at RunGum, um, and he wasn't writing my workouts, but he was really the one kind of taking me under his wing and and providing me with the inspiration and motivation to to take the risk and go go all in on running. And I think that is probably 90% of coaching 10% is riding workouts and 90% is, is all the other stuff mm, okay okay so that explains your your uh, your uh, track from yeah high school athlete or college athlete to, to to pro athlete um what does it take to to make it to that next level and to, to make it to the olympics and and uh yeah get to that really really elite level uh, a lot of resources. I'm not going to lie. you got to have resources. And I was very fortunate to be picked up uh, by the Oregon Track Club and Nike. And so I had basically everything I needed to train full time. Uh, you know, it was a very modest contract, but uh, between the housing stipend and coaching stipend and gear stipend I was getting from OTC and the small salary I got from Nike, I trained full time. And having come from a D3 university where I had to, you know, basically be busy from 6 a.m. to midnight. All of a sudden, I had no obligations other than training, and I really, you know, cherished that that those two years right out of college to to invest everything I had into running, and I did, and that's what took me from uh, kind of a you know a fledgling pro rookie um, having a, a little bit of success to winning the 2008 Olympic trials and. And finishing, I think, 14th at the Beijing Olympic Games. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. So, so what does a typical training week look like then for uh, for such a young athlete, uh, especially middle distance? It's it's not just running, right? No, mostly running. Um, when I was really at my peak fitness, I was doing seven day a week training, uh, about 70 miles a week, and I'd swim three miles a week. I'd swim after my hard workouts just to like flush out the system a little bit and I lifted twice a week but really for me I I lived and died by the mileage and I, I 70 miles a week for a half miler is, is very high volume and, and I basically did every I said no matter what happens this week I just got to hit my mileage and I was blessed with durability so I was able to have that mentality without getting injured I don't always advise athletes to have that mentality but for me I'm prone to distractions and and so I just said you know all that has to happen this week is I have to get my workouts in. I have to get my mileage in. I've got to get my swims and my lifts in. And, and I try to stack as many what I call perfect weeks on top of each other as I could. And sometimes I'd tip stack 12 to 16 perfect weeks back to back and and then taper off that and just go and, and crush PRs. Mm, okay. So is that like a typical um, training routine for, for a middle distance runner? Or, uh, because I thought there would be a lot more gym work included. <clears throat> no, I mean – I was in the gym twice a week, but yeah, I, I was a speed from strength guy. I wasn't, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of us half milers that come up from the 400 and they're in the gym three or four days a week and they take Saturdays and Sundays off and they only work out twice a week. And, and that's the way to train a sprinting type body. But mm -hmm. coming from my cross country background, I was all about pushing the envelope in my training. How many miles can I get in? How hard can I work? And, and so I, I, I lifted a little bit, and, and it certainly helped with, with running economy and posture, but really my strength came from just stacking miles on top of miles for, for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, how about the lifestyle? Is it as glamorous as we think it is? You know, just uh, eat, tra eat, train, sleep, repeat, uh, and travel the yeah, world Yeah, I wouldn't call that the I wouldn't call that the glamorous part. I'd call that the horribly boring part. Yeah. Um, you know, 90% of the time it, it is that. It's, it's eat 
train, go to sleep, read a book, watch a movie, train some more. And I, I, I know that's glamorous to a lot of people. To me, I, I abhorred that lifestyle. It was, it was just so monotonous and so uninspiring. Um, I loved the racing. I loved the, the glamorous part for me was the travel and the racing. Um, and the training I just kind of put up with so I could have the glamorous part. But, um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why I ended up starting my own, my own business when I was 25 is that I was just so, so bored with the monotony of, of eat, sleep, train, repeat. And I needed something more to feel mentally stimulated. And there's a lot of athletes out there that, that have side hustles or go back to school or, you know, do something to keep themselves mentally stimulated um, because that, that monotony can be very, very taxing on, on an athlete's mind. Okay. So what did you do exactly then? <clears throat> I started a company with my, with my coach, Coach Sam. It's called Gold Medal LLC. And okay. it's been the umbrella company for a few of our business ventures. And it is actually the, the parent company of our current venture, RunGum. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Do, do you feel that you needed to make certain sacrifices to, to live the life that uh, you did as a pro athlete? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's one of those things where if you want something bad enough, you'll, you'll make the sacrifices to make it make it a reality. And I missed a lot of birthdays. I missed a lot of Christmases. A lot of family holidays. You know, I couldn't maintain a serious relationship because I was on the road eight months out of the year and. It was hard, but it was worth it at the time of, that, uh, of my life. I, I wanted to see how fast I could be. I wanted to see how good I could get. And I knew that all the things that I was sacrificing, I would be able to have one day. And and with them, I would have this peace, uh, inner peace, knowing that I did everything I could to see how fast I could get. Mm -hmm. What do you see as your biggest achievement in, in your running career? And, and what do you see as your biggest uh, disappointment? Uh, same race, actually. My biggest achievement was running 142.95, um, third fastest time ever by an American. And I actually ran that in an, in an Olympic final. So I ran my best time ever in an Olympic final, which is all you can really ask of yourself. But it was only good enough for fifth place. So um, I'd say my biggest achievement was, was you know, running as fast as I could at the highest stage of our, of our competition. And my biggest failure was failing to run, you know, a little bit faster and getting him a medal. So, um I think that's the one thing that I'll always kind of be bummed out is that I never won an Olympic medal, but, um, I did, I, I truly believe I did everything I possibly could to be ready for that day. It just wasn't in the cards for me that day. What was that a time that otherwise would have guaranteed you a medal? I think it would have won a medal at almost every single other Olympic games in the history of the world, except for two. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Any regrets in, in your running career and, and things that, that you would have done differently? Not really. I mean, I think I played my cards pretty well. Um, had a long career and, and won six U.S. titles and made a dozen world teams and saw the world, made some money. I, I, I think I did it about as good as, as I could have done. Um, you know, I, I wish I had I wish I'd started a business earlier, to be honest. I mean, I think I always knew that <clears throat> that one day my running income would, would evaporate and I'd have to find a way to make money. And so I started a business very early on. At the age of 25, I was pretty young. I just wish I'd started at 22. I, I love entrepreneurial business, but it's one of these things that it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a momentum thing. And the more time you have behind it, the, the stronger it can be. I wish I'd started a business the day I got out of college. Um, but you know, maybe that would have detracted from my running. So I think everything works out the way it's supposed to. But, uh, if I was, if I was advising young Nick or, or another young athlete, I would say start a business as soon as you can, because you have this platform and you can use that platform, uh, to enrich your life rather than in, than enriching the lives of people at Nike or, or Adidas or Reebok or any other of the sponsors you might be peddling. Mm -hmm. When you talk about platform, you talk about you know the social media and, and, and the impact that that has. Not just social media, just your brand, the, the 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 voice that you have. Every time you step on that track, there are eyes on you, and sometimes it's just a few thousand eyes in a stadium. But there were times where billions of people were watching me compete, and you know more often than not, I was pushing other people's products, and I wish I had been. Uh, advertising something that, that I was creating and, and building another brand for myself rather than building up someone else's brand. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay, so this year was your, your final year as a, as, a, as a pro on the track. Um, yeah, what made you take the decision to, to call it quits? Because, yeah, it's only 33. My body kind of called it quits for me. I mean, I still love training and I, I love competing, but my left ankle just can't tolerate running around uh, in a counterclockwise direction anymore. I, I can 
go out and give you 26 miles totally pain free. But if you asked me to run one lap on the track, it would be excruciatingly painful for me. So it's I really just the cornering, can't. Yeah? It's just the cornering. That's the only thing that kept me kept me off the track. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, forced retirement, but you, you already touched on the subject about about the 26 miles. Um, I think a lot of you know athletes after they re- they retire they, f- they fall into some sort of black hole, um, but I don't think that's the case for you. I mean, you you, you got your your company's uh, run gum there, and, and uh, yeah, you also competed in your first marathon. Um, what what made you run that, and and how did it go? Well, I kind of as I was approaching retirement, I looked at this running bucket list that I had, and I'd done pretty much everything I'd ever set out to do, but run a marathon was still on that list, and. So before I <clears throat> completely retired, I wanted to, to tackle that goal. And so I, I picked a fall marathon, a winter marathon, really, uh, the Honolulu Marathon, which was December 10th, just last week. And it was great. I went out there and just kind of put one out there. I, I'd say I ran a marathon rather than raced it. But I was able to run three hours and 35 seconds, which is a time I'm very pleased with and, and had a great time doing it. Okay. So have you figured out wh- what race you're going you're gonna to take to break the three-hour mark? I'm I'm looking for a spring marathon that's really flat, and uh, I haven't picked one just yet. But uh, in January, I'll, I'll select one and start training for it. Mm, okay. D- did you do some serious training for this one, or was it just? Oh uh... uh, no, unfortunately, I didn't. I I did about 25 miles per week, and and the longest run I actually did in preparation for the marathon was a 15 miler. So I was really underprepared. That's why I think if I just invest another 10 or 20 percent of myself into it, I can I can break three for sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, breaking through, that's definitely uh, not, not a problem. But if you do some serious training, uh, how fast do you think you can go? In my prime, I think I could have run about 230. I think right now the best I could possibly train to be is about 240 to 245. Um, and I just want to run 259 <laughs> in my next one. Yeah. So, so you still want to run it? You, you don't want to race it? I mean, <clears throat> I don't know that I, I'm the kind of engine that could could in theory race a, a marathon i think the harder i push in the beginning the more it's going to cost me in the end uh, significantly as a bulky middle distance runner but i want to be able to feel that i can attack the middle miles a little bit more aggressively if i if i can get to the if i can get through the first 10 easy and then really attack 10 through 20 um then then knowing that i'm on pace and knowing that i'm just six miles away from achieving that goal i think w- my mental toughness will carry me through mm-hmm. Yeah, how do you prepare mentally for it? Because you've been, you rate 100 meters. Yeah, you run for about 140, 145. Uh, this, yeah. goes, this goes on for three hours. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a difference. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I got really into mountaineering a couple of years back, and, and I climb a lot now. And I climbed the tallest uh, mountain in Was- the state of Washington. It's called Mount Rainier. And it took me 21 hours to climb it. And, and uh, I you know it's typically done in three days. I did it in, 20, in one 24-hour period. And after that, I just thought, you know, a marathon can't be that hard. You know, I, 24 hours of being mentally focused, um, where my life literally depended on being mentally focused. Um, it, it's, it's significant, it's different than marathoning, but, uh, in preparation mentally, it's, it's, I can't think of a better way to train mentally because it, the marathon just seems so short, almost like a sprint after doing something like that. Yeah, okay. Uh, so is ultra running, uh, something that, that you might uh, have a crack at? I don't think so. I think 26 is about as far as I need to run, <laughs> but uh, I do admire ultra runners for sure. Uh, okay. So we know what you've accomplished in, in your running career so far. Uh, what else is left for you to that you want to accomplish? In, ath- a- in athletics a th- yeah, or in life? Yeah, yeah in sports. And, and, and... I think I'll break through. I'd like to break three this spring, and then I'll, I'll kind of move away from running and move more towards mountaineering and, and start setting bigger and more challenging goals in the mountains. Okay, like Seven Summits and stuff like that? Yeah, I think Seven Summits has its name written on it, my name written on it. I, I, uh, I'm I likely to head up to Kilimanjaro in the summer of 18 and kind of get started on that project. Yeah, yeah it's an easy one to start off, I think. And work your way uh, up to all the way to Everest. That, that, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, it, it would be a very big, probably the biggest one to, to date in my life. Uh, cool. Well, good luck with that. We'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, yeah, let's talk a bit about run gum. Um, when did you start that? And, and yeah, tell us a bit about what it, what it is. We launched the business uh, in October of 2014, but we had the concept for a couple of years prior. We just didn't have the time or energy or money to bring it to market. Um, my business partner, who was my coach, Coach Sam, uh, we decided in the summer of 14 to really, really finally put all of our time and energy in it and, and bring it to market. And 
uh, we took everything that we loved about our favorite energy products, m- mainly energy drinks. We took the caffeine, the taurine, the B vitamins out of the energy drink and put it into a piece of chewing gum. And now that might sound crazy. Like, why would you use chewing gum? Um, and the, the benefit is twofold. One, the act of chewing wakes you up. Um, multiple studies have shown that just the act of chewing energizes you, makes you more alert and focused, which is much better than drinking, which can be shown to make you sleepy. Um, and then also we didn't want anything in our stomach when we were running or cycling or climbing or, or doing a number of different things. We wanted to have the energy and the focus without all the ener- the, the unwanted liquid sloshing around in our stomach. And so using gum as the delivery vehicle we were able to bypass the stomach using sublingual absorption for those actives. We we're able to get the, the actives into your body faster, bypassing the stomach and giving you that same boost in energy and focus without anything in your stomach to slow you down. It's a zero calorie, zero sugar product that gives you this great boost in energy. Okay. So how long did it take you to, de- to develop it? Oh, <clears throat> about six months. Um, we really got to work uh, March of 2014 and six months of, of reformulating and trial and error and, and monkeying around with the manufacturing process and packaging and everything else that goes into bringing a product to market, it was all we'd worked on for six straight months. Okay, so, and, and who's your target audience? Your target, uh, yeah, your target. Uh... Well, you know, it's funny. 90% of, of Americans use caffeine every single day. Mm-hmm. And so anyone that uses caffeine in a functional manner can, can find a use for run gum. Uh, we like to market to athletes because there's nothing like this on the market for athletes, but more often than not, people are buying it to use, uh, two in the afternoon when they're feeling sleepy or putting it in their glove box for long road trips, uh, keeps them awake without having unnecessary bathroom breaks. Uh, we are surprised weekly by, uh, firsthand accounts from people finding unique uses for our, our unique product. Yeah, okay. So uh, where can people get it? In America, they can get it at REI, they can get it at rungum.com, they can get it at amazon.com, uh, they can get it at any one of the, one of our retail partners that can be found at rungum.com. International orders can be placed at vitacost.com, that's V-I-T-A-C-O-S-T.com. All right, cool, I'll put those links up on the show notes page, no problem. Um, yeah, what's, what's the greatest piece of advice that you've ever received um, yeah, in, in, in life or in, in sports or in business? Uh, probably, and it might sound cliche, but it really is just all that, all, all that one needs to be successful is perseverance. And coach Sam taught me that really early on. Um, if you're the kind of person that perseveres and and doesn't let obstacles throw you, you know, left and right, uh, you're going to overcome 99% of obstacles and you're going to be successful. And, uh, I learned that firsthand in running and I'm, I'm learning it again in business. Not a single day goes by where some obstacle isn't thrown in the way of my goals. And when I was younger, I'd let those really affect me emotionally. And then I, I learned that that was just wasted energy and that I just needed to take a deep breath and, and, and figure out how to get around those obstacles. Sometimes that involved just some quiet thinking time. Sometimes it, it involved calling in an expert to help me. Um, sometimes it involved throwing money at it. I mean, there's so, a lot of ways to get around certain obstacles, but there's always a way around an obstacle if you just take your time and, and, uh, and persevere through them. Okay. So uh, in, actually you can really compare the life of a, of a pro athlete to that of a CEO. I mean, things that you've learned as a pro athlete that you can also use in your life as a, in business. hundred percent. And and what most pro athletes don't realize is that they are the CEO of their own business. Um, you know, it's, it's a common misconception that an athlete sponsored by Nike is an employee of Nike. They aren't actually, they're independent contractors and really they run their own business and I encourage young athletes that are, are, you know, venturing into this world of professional athletics to always view themselves as the CEO of their own business rather than an employee of anybody because they're not. Okay, cool. So what, what can they do then to, to market themselves besides your social media? <clears throat> social media is a great way to market themselves, but, uh, you know, publicity stunts go a long way. And, and for better or for worse, I, I utilize publicity stunts frequently throughout my career to build my brand. Um, you know, starting a business may be one of the, the ultimate ways to grow not only your personal brand, but a brand, uh, that you're trying to create simultaneously. Um, you know, a great example of that is that the Nick Simmons brand grew exponentially once I became an entrepreneur with run gum. Um, they worked hand in hand and, and they supported each other and helped build each other up. 
So there's there's definitely a lot of different ways to do it. But the sooner you realize that you're building a brand and that that brand is going to create value for you down the line and not somebody else, the sooner you, it empowers you. Okay, makes sense. All right, my final one. How do you find, how do you define success and and how do you measure up to your own definition? Oh man, that's tough. I mean, just black and white success is 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 uh, turning a profit at the end of the day. I mean, as a businessman. I have a fiduciary duty to the shareholders in our business to make sure that that's what we're focused on. Um, but that's not the intrinsic. That's just the, 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 the success on paper <clears throat> at the end of the day, feeling a sense of purpose and, and happiness and uh, pride in one's work and, and everything that one does, I think is, is really the true definition of success. And, um, Sometimes that does mean focusing on profits when I when I'm able to have a profitable month and, and put money in my my pocket and the pocket of the employees that we employ at run gum and, and, and pay my business partner. That makes me extremely happy. And I think that's a super uh, successful way to look at it. But, you know, certainly some things that that don't put any money in my pocket, like running a three hour marathon. I mean, that was that, that, that made me very happy. And I would say I was very successful in that as well. So I, I think what it comes down to is is feeling that sense of purpose and, and pride in what you're doing. Oh, okay, cool. That's a nice piece of wisdom to finish off. Um, yeah, how can people get in touch with you if they want to, Nick? They can follow me on social. Um, I'm across all platforms at Nick Simmons, Simmons with a Y. And uh, you can always reach out to me via RunGum as well. We've got a great team that's that's happy to answer all questions, RunGum related or fitness related. Uh, a lot of resources at RunGum.com for people as well. Okay, put those links up on the show notes page, and yeah, feel free to give some love to to sponsors or partners. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, it's it's all about RunGum now. I, I was sponsored by Nike for seven years and Brooks for four, and it was really uh, an incredible opportunity to work with those partners, but. <laughs> moving forward uh i'm ha proud proudly employed by run gum <laughs> cool stuff anything else you want to plug no thanks for the opportunity to do so though all right okay, no problem yeah thanks for your time uh, it's much appreciated and uh yeah i hope uh, everyone will like it thanks so much hi junkies thanks for listening to this uh, episode with uh, nick simmons now if you like these little interviews and uh, don't want to miss any future episodes Just head over to iTunes or Stitcher and uh, yeah, simply subscribe to the show. I would also like to thank everyone who has uh, left a rating and a review. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, and if you haven't done so, yeah, please consider leaving me one. Uh, that will definitely help continue growing the show. Uh, we're also available on Spotify, so if that's your uh, preferred medium, just uh, search for Endurance Junkie Podcast in the search bar and uh, you will find us no problem. Just don't forget to click the follow button if you want the show to be listed amongst your uh, favorite podcasts. Alright guys, thanks again for listening, and I uh, hope you'll join me next time. Cheers!